Um, welcome again. My name is Hamish Cochran. I'm an academic in the School of Forestry, but I'm also the Dean of Engineering and Forestry. So the next 50-odd minutes, we've got a series of people who are going to talk to you. I'm going to try and remember to talk into this um, microphone because we're being videoed. Uh, I'm going to start by looking at what it means to be studying engineering or forestry in your first year. We've got the engineering physical sciences staff who will come and talk to you, and we've also got a short presentation from the Institution of Professional Engineers New Zealand. Okay, um, this really is sort of University 101, I guess. Uh, a quick overview of what you can expect. You've all managed, obviously, to survive the first day or two of being in halls or flatting or, or being at home still. How many of you are at Uni Hall? Oh my, we've all woken up finally after the toga party. All right, good. So, I mean, you've started to work out where things are on campus, you know, in terms of libraries, the Students' Association. I'm sure you've all worked out where student services are um, in terms of where you pay fees and do all that sort of thing. Hopefully, and I, I do recognise a few faces here, so some of you have found your way to the College of Engineering office, um, but that's somewhere else that I want to talk about in a wee while. Um, for many of you, it's going to be a bit of a transition. So I suspect most of you have been sitting in classes last year of you know, 20, 25, 40 maybe students. For those of you doing ENGR 101, and that'll be most of you sitting here, but I'll come back to that in a minute, you're going to be sitting in this lecture theatre alongside about 349 other people. So the size of the classes that you're involved in, in the first year in particular, will be quite different from what you've been used to. Now we typically lecture uh, for about, well, 50 minutes normally, so it's sort of a 50 minute block and then 10 minutes to move around a bit. Um, some of the classes, particularly the ones that you are doing, will have laboratories or tutorials associated with them. So physics and chemistry classes, for instance, there will actually be smaller groups of you timetabled in to do practical stuff um, during lab courses in, uh, during the week. Tutorials. You've, most of you will be doing ENGR 101. Maths is the other uh, area that you do quite a bit of, and they run tutorials. So again, that's smaller groups doing problem solving and working perhaps with a tutor rather than lecture. First point is, having spent the last two weeks going through people who have missed the cut from last year, one is, or a, a number of them have commented about not attending all the lectures or not attending tutorials because it just didn't seem that important at the time. Please do. It makes it so much easier to pass a course. All right, so these sorts of things, the shoots, the labs, are a required part. You'll find in the courses that you end up with bits of tree, i.e. handouts. Um, you may hear about this thing called Learn, and once you've fully completed enrolment, it's really important that you get on to the Learn site. It's a learning support site, and each of the courses will have an, a zone on that site, and uh, resource materials will be distributed there which you can access. So that's another important thing. Um, lectures. Now I still lecture even though I'm uh, a dean and uh, I'm from the forestry science side so we're nowhere as big as the engineers. How many foresters have we got? Anybody? B-Force fan? Oh wow. Double the number that were here this morning. Fantastic guys. So these uh, people are slightly smaller classes, more like 30 to 50 mark. Um, we all discover that as uh, we go through the semester that interest might start to drop off in lectures, particularly the 8am start ones. And you'll start with, I don't know, 349 people, and it'll go down to 300, and by the end of the um, semester, it's down around the 150 mark. Lectures are really important. Most of us have a very, very bad habit of emphasising stuff in lectures that then turns up in exams. All right? And the Learn site, most of us have a very bad habit of not emphasising the stuff that will turn up in exams. So lectures also are very important. The other thing, particularly with the, the big lectures, is you're going to find that somebody generally somebody sitting down the front, will have the guts to put their hand up in the last minute and ask a question. Now there'll be a group generally at the back row will be going, oh, not that person again. Um, but about 90% of you will be sitting there thinking, well, great, that was actually something I was wondering about as well. So lectures are a place where you're going to get that little bit extra interaction going. Right, the beginning on the hour up until 1pm. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, that's when you start. Don't walk in 10 minutes late. And if you are unavoidably late, find out for your, each of your individual lecture theatres how you come in discreetly. Discreetly does not involve walking across the front of C1 waving at me as you go past. All right? There's a couple of entries up the back. So that's, that's something to work on. Now we run through to 12 o'clock, 12 till 12.50, 12 
And then after one o'clock, they start 10 minutes after the hour. And it gives people who've got lots of lectures and labs a 20 minute break during the middle of the day. So it starts at 1.10, 2.10, runs till 3, 3.10 runs till 4 and so on. We've already talked about large classes. Um, a really important part of uh, both engineering and forestry is working as a team. Start that right from the get-go. Introduce yourself to people that you don't know. Particularly in your laboratory classes and your tutorials, there's a great opportunity to sort of meet people from all over, well, all over the world, really. Ah, these evil little devices, all right? Most of you seem to have them nowadays. Please, in lectures and in labs, put them onto quiet. Okay, different um, academics have different strategies for dealing with people who offend with these. I like public humiliation, all right? Um, but just remember to turn the damn things at least to quiet. Um, I mean, this is real basics, but take notes, for goodness sake. And if you are not so good at taking notes, we have something called the Learning Skills Centre who run a whole pile of different workshops on a whole range of different academic skills, including how to take effective lecture notes. Go access them, because you're paying for it. We've talked about lectures starting or lasting for about 50 minutes. Right, really important, take your own notes. I remember my second year, so it's way, way, way back, we used to work in teams of three, was a particularly appalling lecturer. He, we had blackboards then. He would write, he'd write on an OHP and he'd speak. One person would cover the blackboard, one person would cover the OHP and the other person had to write down everything they said. And then we had to spend an hour and a half afterwards condensing everything together to make sure we'd got it. Take your own notes, it's really important. You may be given hard copy, keep it somewhere, you know, rather than sort of dropping it as you leave the lecture theatre. And the other thing is, of course, this Learn um, website, which is very useful. And I'll come back to that final point in a moment. All right, participate. It's just common courtesy to turn up on time. It's a big one. Uh, you'll find, maybe not so much for lectures, but certainly for tutorials and often for laboratory classes, you'll actually be set a task the week prior to complete for you know the next week. Don't, don't try the... If I keep my eyes closed, they won't pick up that I haven't done it strategy. All right? It's a case of being on top of things and being prepared in advance. Um, ask questions, join in discussions, involve yourself in the lab activities, the tutorial activities, and actually sort of take a hold of your own learning. Right, much easier to keep up, don't catch up. And I guess I should have explained what a dean does. So I'm a, a lecturer 30% of my time in the School of Forestry, and then the other 70% I'm Dean of Engineering and Forestry. I'm the person that invariably ends up seeing students when there's something going wrong. And often they talk about time management to me. The fact that they, you know, they've just gotten overwhelmed with work, they haven't kept up with things. So right from next Monday, work out a system of keeping up to date around lectures, labs and tutorials. Now we typically suggest that an hour in you know, standing listening to me for 50 minutes is then two lots of 50 minutes sort of catching up on that, whether it be revising, whether it be doing some broader reading. And it's a case in many respects of thinking like coming here as a 40 hour a week job. I mean, it's a nice simple way of looking at it. So spend your time reading through your notes. Do prepare for your assignments rather than leaving it until the last minute. Um, write your lab reports you know, and get it going quickly. The library, the library staff are going to come and talk to you today. That's a really important asset that's going to be fundamental to the next four years for you. And um, for exam periods and assignment due dates, remember to plan in advance. Right, help and advice. I can't emphasise this enough because by the time I see people, they re you know, the really the wheels have fallen off the bus, so to speak. So if you are struggling for whatever reason, seek help early. And that help is available in all sorts of different places. So your course lecturers or tutorial uh, tutors, they're certainly there for you to ask advice of or to go and quietly say, look, I'm struggling a bit around this, can you give me some advice? Um, if you don't want to approach them, you're very, very welcome to come and see the college office, and in particular myself and the two student advisors. Because particularly for the intermediate engineers, you're not into one of the professional programs yet, so we are your port of call, your mind for the year, all right? Foresters, you're a nice small unit, and you've got Jeanette over there who's fantastic, but again, you can come and see me as well. And it's not just about academic um, advice, it's also about anything that's impacting upon your academic studies. So if it's personal, personal circumstance that is getting in the way of studying effectively, come and see us. 
I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, but I am aware of the support services that are available on campus, and I can effectively say, well, okay, this is the person you need to go and contact. Um, make an appointment, that's always courteous. You know, if you want to go and see the lecturer about something to do with uh, a lecture or, or an assignment, make an appointment with them. Go to shoots and, and join in any study groups, and particularly those of you in the halls. NSOC, which none of you have heard of at all and none of you are going to join, um, NSOC runs very effective uh, tutorials based in the halls. So if you're in the halls, make sure you take advantage of that. Talked about our student advisors, we've got two. We've got Cess King and Aaron Yule. And we're in the college office, which is right opposite the um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Library. Learning Skills Centre, they're over in the Students Association. They're a fantastic resource as well. And they're available for a whole range of things. Not just, you know, um, how do I take better notes, exam techniques, helping you uh, put together more effective written reports, that sort of thing. Fantastic resource. Now, the other thing I should note, um, most of you will be doing eight courses this year. So four courses in semester one, four courses in semester two. If for whatever reason you decide, right, I'm going to drop this course. Dropping the course is not as simple as saying, I'm just going to stop turning up to lectures. Because if that's the strategy you adopt, what will happen is at the end of the semester, you'll find that the course code's still there, and there'll be a small letter E afterwards. And unlike NCEA, E is not for excellence, all right? So if you're going to drop a course, you actually need to go and see somebody to do that. And the best port of call is the college office. All right. Now, you guys probably aren't as affected as BA, BSC, BCom students would be with this, because both the forestry and the engineering students have a very structured um, first year of required courses. Now, on the website, there's all sorts of information about the last day you can drop a course without incurring you know, a, a loss of fees or something like that. So make sure that you know um, when that is. Right, resources for you guys. Foresters, you're lucky. You're nice and smaller unit. So within the School of Forestry itself, Jeanette Allen's a fantastic resource, and you'll get to know Jeanette um, from next week when you start turning up to uh, classes. For the engineers, we have the Unit of Intermediate Engineering and Science Studies, which is based in the college office. You can drop in and talk to a student advisor. For some of you, and I'm recognising some faces you've been in over the last week to talk about enrolment matters. You can get information from there. You can seek help and support. Come and see one of us. And it, it, it's located opposite the Engineering and Physical Sciences uh, Library. Now, this year we've started about um, a Facebook thing, and I don't know much about Facebook, so I'll just do what I'm told and tell you about it, which is UC Engineering, and I'll, I'll come back to it at, at the end. But again, we're using that as a, a communication tool and somewhere where you can find resources. Right, lecturers. And I'll come to what, what their funny titles and names mean in a second. We're here to help you, frankly. You guys and the government are investing a lot of resource in being here. It's a fantastic time, but you're here to pursue a, an academic degree. So seeing as you're willing to sink that sort of resource in so as people like I can um, be gainfully employed, we, we are here to help you. We're a resource for you. So the types of things that we can do is we can look at draft um, work. Now for the big courses, as you can imagine, it's unlikely to be an individual lecturer of a look at 850 drafts of an ENGR 101 report. It's more likely to be one of the tutors, but we're there as a resource from that point of view. We can help discuss results. If, you know, if you've gone wrong somewhere and we give you some feedback and it's not clear, we're there to actually sort of clarify it for you. We can explain stuff you haven't understood in class um, and we can give feedback on you know, where your thought process might be going. Now, if you email one of us, my ESP is very poor, um, explain clearly what you want. What, what is the question? Do please address us relatively politely. I'm, I'm reasonably tolerant, but hey, you, as a header in an email, sort of puts me on the back foot a little bit, I must admit. All right, so just remember to, to and we'll come back to sort of what titles mean in a second, just be reasonably polite. And the other really useful thing is to include your full name and student ID number at the end of the email, because it just means that if there are four John Stewarts, we know which John Stewart has actually asked us the um, question. Right, titles. For instance, I'm Dr. Hamish Cochran. I've completed a PhD. So therefore, in academic sort of circles, I have the right to be called doctor. You'll find that some of your lecturers aren't, they might be a lecturer, they might be a senior lecturer. I'm a senior lecturer myself. Some will come in and they will be called associate professor or professor. And that is a much higher standing than somebody of my rank, for instance. So they, um, they have these titles. 
the younger ones in particular, we're pretty flexible. And hey, you may not be quite it, but you know we don't insist that you call us doctor. Um, some of the more um, established people may quite enjoy being having their title as part of it, and you'll get a feel for it with your um, diff different lecturers. You'll also have graduate teaching assistants, particularly in the tutorials and the laboratory classes. Now they're typically either research master students or PhD students. So they've, they've done an undergraduate degree, they've generally done at least a master's degree or a part way through a master's degree. And particularly in maths, you also run into some of the senior tutors. Um, so the e-math courses have senior tutors that do a lot of the work there. And again, their titles uh, may vary. I guess one of the key things though is that you need to understand that the academics lecturing to you are actively involved in research. So in my, my own case, I'm interested in biosecurity, I do work around pest management, so my research feeds into the lectures that I give to my undergraduates. And so the people who are talking to you about in eMath 119 will be doing active um, research. All right, between classes. Some of you don't have uh, much time between classes, you'll be rushing to the next one, but when you do get a break, reread your notes. Sounds crazy, but I can assure you what you've written now, four days later, you start thinking, well, what did I put there? Identify stuff you don't understand. It's really important. Um, use the resources available to actually answer those things that you don't understand and, and sort of sort out your notes so it's um, easily accessible. Get on top of things in terms of upcoming work um, and just really try and master those skills early and that way you'll hopefully avoid stress. Okay, a bit about the college that you're now part of. We're a group of academic departments and also some research centres. We have approximately 2,700 headcount students here within the college. Um, I shall lie, it's a lot slightly higher than that, about 2829. The majority of those are undergraduate students and the undergraduate students are spread across the engineers, the forestry science people, but also from um, maths and stats and computer science and software engineering. So it's quite a broad variety of people. About 10% of the students in the college, slightly higher than that, are um, international students from all over the world. So the departments, um, we've got the School of Forestry, which is the only national department of forestry in the country at a university. We've got the Computer Science and Software Engineering Department, Maths and Stats, and then we've got four core engineering departments, which is what you'd expect in a um, College of Engineering. So Chemical and Process Engineering, Civil and Natural Resources, Electrical and Computer, and finally Mechanical Engineering. We've got two core qualifications that the college owns, and in fact the Faculty of Engineering and Forestry owns. And that's the BE ONS, which the majority of you sitting here are engaged in, but also the four-year Bachelor of Forestry Science, which can have honours with it as well. Some of our departments, so the Maths and Stats people, the Computer Science people, teach into Bachelors of Arts, Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Commerce, and generally around those areas, so Maths, um, Statistics and Computer Science. So that's the sort of undergraduate landscape. Now the BE ONS, this is the four-year qualification that the majority of you are interested in here. This is an internationally recognised qualification. We have a standard, an international standard called the Washington Accord. We're audited or accredited against that by something called IPENS, which is the Institution of Professional Engineers New Zealand, and Kavita Kansara from there is coming to talk to you in a few minutes. And they effectively act as a quality management agency to ensure that what we are transferring, exposing you to, is of an international standard. Now the advantage to you is that, because all our programs have that accreditation, is it means your degree is portable. So you can go to other parts of the world and actually have your degree recognised. There's about 850, I think it was 846, as the number was this morning, um, of you enrolled in the Engineering Intermediate. Forestry Science, we're much more exclusive. There are 32 of you in the first year, which is the highest number in over 10 years, so fantastic time to be a forester. Um, I'll come back to the foresters in a minute. You know, that's quite a large number of people. So in your courses, ENGR 101, which the majority of people will be doing, there are pretty much 850 of you, or 846, doing that. So they'll be running multiple streams. This is what an engineering degree looks like. Um, 
and I'm going to just focus really around year one for the intermediate years. Some of you are doing modified intermediates. There's about 80 or 90 people this year who, because of their NCA results or they've done, say, a distance maths paper at a university, are doing a slightly different model. All of you, pretty much, are doing those five blue papers. Modified is a little bit different, but most of you are doing those five blue papers. So engineering, three EMAS, and the physics. And then depending on whether you really, really, really want to be a civil engineer or really, really, really want to be an electrical engineer, in those ducky, greeny, bluey things, you're doing slightly different papers there. So there is a core, if you like, where everybody's in it, and then there's a little bit of flexibility around other papers. And the good news is you don't have to panic now, because most of you are pretty much enrolled. You've got the first half of the year to work out, actually, I really want to be a natural resource engineer. All right, so therefore, I was going to be an electrical engineer, so I need to change my second semester papers by one or two, just to make sure I've got the right papers for civil or natural resources. So we've got that flexibility that you can have an epiphany sometime in June and say, actually, I want to be a forest engineer, which is a damn fine program. OK, I'll come back to that later. Um, once you've done that uh, first year, you then move into three professional years. So this is where you go off and you become a civil engineer or a natural resource engineer or mechanical or whatever. All right? And the way we label those is we have intermediate and then first, second and third pro years. And I think probably it's worth, just very quickly, one of the key differences between us and Auckland, Auckland's the other New Zealand university that has a very wide range of um, degree offerings. The key difference is they, they select you before you get into year one. We select you at the end of year one. Right, so it's open entry into intermediate at the moment. We've got eight different specialisations, which I'm sure most of you are pretty um, aware of. I'll start with the most important, forest engineering. Um, computer engineering, electrical and electronic, mechatronics, mechanical, civil, natural resources, and chemical and process. So quite a broad range of different engineering um, disciplines. And that ENGR 101 paper in particular that's the vehicle where you're going to hear a lot about, well, what does a civil engineer do? Or what does a chemical and process engineer do? OK. I've talked about the large number of you. There's about 846 doing the intermediate. And I'm sure that many of you are aware that we do not take a full 846 students through into the professional years. So we have something called limitation of entry into the professional years. And this really comes as a result of the fact there are only so many places that we can effectively resource in terms of staff, in terms of physical space, through those professional years. We get you to choose your specialisation in towards the end of the year, and most of you will have made a choice well before this, and we ask you to give us first, second, third, all right? So we've got an idea of the types of areas that you're interested in. The places into the individual programs are allocated on academic merit something called the grade point average. You'll hear me talk about GPA all year. Okay, So grade point average is how it's worked out. We also look at the papers you've been doing. So you've been doing eight papers. You must pass every single one of those papers. All right. So it's GPA and yes, I've passed every single one of my papers. What that means is you might pass all eight papers and be ranked somewhere where perhaps you don't get your first choice. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. Now, in the past, I have stood here, which is now only, well, one year, two years, two years, I've said this now. I've stood here and said to this collected group, if you get a B average this year across those eight papers that you're going to do and you pass everything, I'll guarantee you a place in the program of your first choice. Now, that came back to bite me this year. So mechatronics. That was what I said last year. Mechatronics, we've got 30 places that we typically resource for. 38 students had a GPA of 6 or better, i.e. a B plus or better. And I had to eat cake. No, eat my words, that's right. So I've stopped using the G word. I was always nervous about the G word. And I've come up with something suitably non-committal. So a B to B plus average will place you in the running, are my new words. They will place you in the running for the specialisation of your choice. So I'm talking about a GPA of five to six. All right? This is why we ask you to tell us what are your top three choices. Because sometimes, and as an example, mechanical went down to around about a GPA of four, just above a four this year. If you get a 3.9, you might actually fall below that cut. 
Okay, so you may not be able to get the program of your, your first choice program. But it may well be that Civil, for instance, is really keen and they've gone down to a lower um, position and they're able to offer you a position. All right, so I'm beginning that message that I will come back to through the ENGR 101 course of this year is all about your academic performance. You're here to work. Right, the other important thing though is that we're looking at a dual pathway. For some of you, you're, you've been you're very good at maths, you're very good at physics, and you've come in because a couple of teachers or maybe a family member or a family friend have said, hey, give engineering a bit of a shot. Sounds good, good jobs at the end, go all over the world. Six months into the engineering intermediate, you're waking up in the morning thinking, this is the last thing I ever want to do again in my life. All right, no problem. We have dual pathways uh, from the engineering intermediate. You can go down the professional engineering route, you can go down a physical sciences route. So we have a lot of students whose GPA is very good, so they would get a position in one of the um, professional specialisations, but they decide that engineering is not for them. No problem, they go on and do a BSc in physics and maths and chemistry. We've got some who come over to the Bachelor of Forestry Science. It's not limiting you just to engineering, so please be aware of that during the year. Here's an idea of numbers. Um, you can see that we've got some quite small programs, so computer engineering and forest engineering quite small. Electrical and electronic and civil are quite large. 30 into mechatronics, we've actually had to take 38, so we've had to get some extra resourcing there. I hate using the guarantee word. Um, 95 into mechanical. And these are typically our targets, and again, typically we'll go slightly over. All right? So it's around about 450 students in total into each of the professional years. Just another way of looking at it, so the intermediate year, the BE ONS obviously is what the majority of the engineers are keen on, and the BSc with major in physics, maths, chemistry or computer science, and there are always other degree options with the suite of papers that you're doing, particularly around the mathematics. The other degrees love numerate students, particularly in the BCom, and we very much like them over in the B4Sci. All right, that's the engineers taken care of. Now the important people in the room, the foresters, a couple of slides around you and then we're going to hand over to IPENS to talk to you. Um, we are the only Department of Forestry or School of Forestry at a university in New Zealand. Like the engineering students, you've, you're going through a four-year professionally oriented degree. It's not accredited in the same way that IPENS acts as accreditation body against the Washington Accord, but it is a professionally recognised degree. A lot of our students do a double degree, either with um, science or commerce. It's much smaller than the engineers. There are lots of engineers in the college. Okay? There's about 100, 110 forest B4 size students. For some of you, you'll be, well, you're going to do a suite of papers, which I'll look at in a second. You'll find that there's uh, outsiders, as we call them, come into some of those papers, the non-B4 side people. But other than that, you're a pretty small select group. Now, I'll talk about honours here. So just like the engineers, you've got quite a structured pathway. So your first year you're doing about half forestry science and the other half biology, chemistry and stats. You'll find that some of those forestry papers like one for one, you know, how do you measure a tree to a forest type thing will be primarily the forestry science students. Others papers like forestry 111 will be quite broader and there might even be some engineers in there. Um, second year is also very structured. In third and fourth year, you can see orange boxes, and that's where you can start electing to take particular courses. And for you engineers, similar types of um, options open up for you in your second and third prize, so your year three and year four as well. And you can see the Forry 414 right up the top there. That is an additional honours paper that you take if you want to get your degree with honours. So it's a little, the BE ONS and the B4SI are different. So the BE ONS, those of you doing engineering, you're automatically into an honours degree. You effectively have to knock yourself out. With the Foresters, you're not automatically in. You have to perform to a level where we then invite you into the honours stream. Okay, quick bit about the College of Engineering. So I'm the Dean, the Academic Dean of Engineering and Forestry. We have an Academic Manager who is Lisa Carter, Student Advisors who I've mentioned already, which is Cess and Aaron. We've got a Practical Work Coordinator who becomes very important to you once you get into your professional specialisations in engineering, Cheryl McNichol. And probably the person that most of you have already met if you've come to the College office is Vicky O'Sullivan, who's our front, front house. You can get us on Eng Degree Advice, which also works if you want forestry advice, but foresters, try Jeanette in the first instance. 
And you're all welcome to come and see us over in the, um, the Engineering College office, or the Unit of Intermediate in Engineering Studies. And sitting over all of us and over all of the research centres and the um, academic departments is our College of Engineering Pro Vice-Chancellor, which is uh, Professor Jan Evans Freeman. So that's the person that I report to and all the academic heads report to. Right, a bit of help and advice. Um, this Facebook thing worries me, worries me. But anyway, we're on there apparently now and you apparently connect somehow and it does stuff for you. And Lisa Korczycki, who's our marketing and outreach person, is just laughing at me. Um, you guys probably understand what Facebook does much better than I can. So we're on Facebook. You can physically come and see us. There's email. There's Facebook, because I was told to say it three times. It's all there as a resource. Now, the other thing, which I should have mentioned much earlier, is immediately after us, there is a presentation from uh, the student services. And that's a more generic presentation which uh, looks at the types of support that is available to all students on campus. Enjoy your year. It's going to be a real challenge because irrespective of whether you're in forestry science or in the engineering program, it's new and it's different. You're going to feel a lot of press pressure, particularly engineers, around the selection into uh, the professional programs. So it is a case of work hard, but enjoy yourself as well. Now, do I have a minute for questions? One. I'm allowed to take two questions, maybe. I'll go on. Remember I said something about interact? Yes. Alright, because um, 800 and 50 people and I added it up, you know, roughly for um, specializations that we need to. Um, what happens to the other people if they had passed, but the two players must have been able to get into it? For that all that was switched to a it's a good question. No, I'll, it's exactly the same question we got this morning. Um, what happens at this time of year in particular? So the question is, 850 go through. We've only said 450, and it's slightly higher than that, around the 470, but it's still far less than go through. Uh, what happens to those students whose GPA is low, but they've passed everything, but they don't get selected into one of the programs? Range of things. Some will choose to go off to CPIT or something like that and do the B-Eng Tech. We've had students who've completed our intermediate and who have gone to Auckland, because Auckland's very happy to accept some of our students, if they've got, again, space in the programs. We've got some students, as you suggested, do actually repeat an intermediate year. Okay, and they might take a, some 200 level physics and maths and things like that, and have another go round, working on bringing their GPA up to get into the program of their choice. Some will go to other degree programs, so we normally pick up three or four engineers at least who come over to forestry science, which is great, and others may well come off to BCom, um, BA, BSc options. But some do elect to um, go on. And I, I guess the other point to make is in terms of clean students, so that's every, students who have passed all eight papers, it's probably only around the 550 to 600 who actually get through passing everything. All right. So a lot of students miss out on a paper and will elect to do a second intermediate year focusing on build, bringing that grade up. That's a good question. Yes? Can you do it in some of them? Ah, right. Okay. Now, I know some of you, we've been advising um, around an introductory paper, and this is the last question I've got because Lisa's moving now. Um, so you might be doing, say, Chemistry 114 before doing Chemistry 111. And what you've found we may have done is bumped something like EMath 119 into summer school. So yes, you can actually use summer effectively to complete off the eight required papers for, um, for the engineering intermediate. All right? And we're very happy, if you've got worries or want some more advice around that, come over to the um, college office and we will speak to you. Right, pleasure now to introduce two of our um, EPS staff, which is not a very wise way, but the library staff. So we've got Deborah and Dave, and I'll hand over to them. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I'm Deborah. This is Dave. Um, and we're from the EPS library. Sometimes we call it the ESP library. We know um, what you're thinking. <laughs> we know what you're thinking. Um, we, the, the EPS library contains um, the specialist collections for engineering and for forestry and for the physical sciences. So whether you, go, uh, whether you stick with um, engineering and forestry or whether you decide that the sciences are for you, then we're going to be the place where you'll spend most of your time. Um, there are also four other libraries on campus, um, so we're going to bring up a map. 
Is it Robert? Okay. Okay, so we've got a map, and if we click for each one, we've got Education Library, so that's on the education campus across the island fields. Um, EPS Library at the top here, um, that's us. We've also got Macmillan Brown Library, which has the Maori and Pacific collections, Law Library, and Central Library has sort of all the leftover stuff. Um, and Central Library, of course, is the tallest building on campus, which you can't miss. Um, we've been renovating EPS Library over the summer. Part of that is because of the earthquake, but most of it was because the library was built in something like 1967 and the carpet dated from 1967. So we've now got um, these, everything is completely updated and um, we've got these nice new machines. This is a self-check machine. Um, so you're going to be able to just get whatever book you want off the shelf get your Canterbury card out, which you will keep on you at all times, I'm sure, um, and then just plonk them down on that machine to borrow your books. So we've got your textbooks here. Um, you'll probably want to buy most of your textbooks, whether new or second hand, but we've also got copies in the library if you forget one one day or if you don't feel like lugging all of your textbooks around with you all the time. Um, and they can be borrowed on three hour loan. Um, we do like to warn people that because we're trying to share these textbooks around 850 of you, um, they, they are three-hour loans and we have little fines on them which can grow very quickly into big fines. So when you borrow a book, just put the due time on your cell phone to remind you to bring it back on time. So how do you actually find all these books? On the library website, which is um, a nice easy um, URL, it's library.canterbury.ac.nz. Um, we've got this multi-search box here. And all you need to do is put in the title and author of your textbook. So it might be Anton Calculus, um, something like that. And then when you get the record, it's going to have this code, something like TA145 point yada, 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 yada. Or it might be QD or Q. Um, that code tells you where it is on the shelf. So if you've been in a school library or a public library, they use the Dewey Decimal System, which is just numbers. At the university, we've got so many books that just numbers isn't enough for us, so we have to put the letters in there as well. So you find this number, then you can use that to find the book on the shelf, then you bring the book and your Canterbury card to the self-check machine and borrow the book. Okay, hand over to Dave. Okay, just, just about um, what we have here on the, on the page here, um, a couple of journals. So of the, the university libraries, we have an annual budget of about $6 million we spend on materials buying. Um, Five million of that is spent on journals. So a journal is a magazine, except normally, of course, they're um, referred to as um, peer-reviewed. So an academic has viewed the content, the spelling, the punctuation, all very important things, um, and verified that the, um, the science behind it is intact and um, allows it to be published. So we've got a range of material here. We have physical journals, which are in the library, and electronic. We probably, most of our money, we have a subscription to about 1,000 journals physically only nowadays, currently subscribed to a New of Canterbury. We have 55,000 electronic. So it's a vast collection. What we have, you can't actually see it. It's all stored on servers, etc. We also have other sort of collections throughout um, the library to, as engineering students and science students or forestry students. You're allowed to use uh, materials from any of the libraries on cross campus. Um, they include DVDs and videos. So we have a collection of some interesting, fun DVDs, some science, some teaching. Um, DVDs and videos available throughout um, the libraries. Um, public, the Central Library um, has a, because um, an arts, and I'm an arts background, they have approximately two and a half thousand movies, um, particularly strong in Chinese martial arts cinema, um, available because they study it. Um, and so there are thousands of DVDs you can borrow for free for up to a couple of weeks without paying any money. Okay, what we also have is in engineering. Um, as many specialist collections, we have what's called standards. So everything is built to a standard. Um, with a safety standard, with a glass standard, with a, you know, how glass fall, falls and behaves. So like most buildings, and you've seen the news, the, um, the libraries and the University of Canterbury had some serious failures during the earthquake. We had um, an, an EPS library, they referred to it as non-structural failures. 
which means the ceiling, the subject of the ceiling failed, um, individual tiles fell down, in some case two floors, um, and punched through um, MDF desks that thick, straight through, um, hit trunking, made aluminium trunking look like um, tin foil. Um, so it's a severe failure. Um, we also had glass break, um, and in between the, the shear walls, um, lugs and nuts um, shear off. So what they had to do is, for us over the summer, we've been doing a lot of work. Obviously we were doing, Deborah hinted at, our building project from, we're doing stage one, stage two of the building project, plus earthquake remediation. So our entire ceilings have been replaced, so one quarter of the weight, and laterally secured, so ceiling tiles no longer fall down on queue. During the last year's um, exam time, we had an engineering student up studying level three, um, uh, one of the five blah earthquakes hit, um, a ceiling time the ceiling tile crashed in front of him, hit his desk in front of him, he leaned back, the ceiling tile hit, he moved the ceiling tile out of the way and carried on studying. <laughs> Bravery. Okay, what he didn't understand is that that ceiling tile creates a space and the next earthquake, everything comes down. So, unfortunately, we had to kick him out pretty quickly. Um, so, we've got lots of standards for building material. We have, we're there for you. Please use us. We've got help desks. Um, if you're building something to a standard, um, obviously how it's built and designed, but we're also we're available um, on a blog site, on a chat site, on Facebook, we have a presence there. Um, we have Ask Live, which is um, using um, Mebo or other software available behind. There are three of us, just come in and see us. Any questions we can help you with, whether it's referencing um, your assignments, whether it's finding materials, whether it's physical material, or electronic material, or finding an international um, set that you need from somewhere else in the world, we can help you with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Kavita. I'm from the Institution of Professional Engineers, New Zealand, otherwise known as IPENS. How many of you in this room have heard of IPENS? Fantastic. And how, how many of you have actually applied for an IPENS Foundation Scholarship? Okay, just to let you know, the results of those should be out in the middle of March. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about IPENS. We're a not-for-profit professional body. We're based in Wellington, and we represent engineers from all disciplines. Some of the things we do... We facilitate agreed standards. We work to align New Zealand engineering practice with international best practice. And we also accredit your engineering degree at Canterbury University. We provide advice to the government via submissions. We support engineering best practice. And we also are involved in a program called Future in Tech. Have any of you in this room heard of Future in Tech? Cool. So Future in Tech is a program that's put into place to help uh, school-aged children and college-aged children to think more about careers in engineering, science and technology. So the main reason I'm here today is just to tell you about student membership, but I'm just going to give you a little overview of membership classes at IPENS to begin with. We've got non-competence-based membership classes, which means there are classes of membership where you're not assessed, and then we have competence-based membership classes. So as a student studying at the University of Canterbury, you're all welcome to join IPENS as a student member. And once you finish studying, you will aspire to be a professional member of IPENS or go towards your chartered professional engineer status, and that's when you will undertake a competence membership assessment. So, the main reason I'm here is to encourage you to be a student member. So, why would you want to be part of IPENS? First of all, it's a really good way of learning about other issues that are taking place in the engineering um, environment and being part of your professional body. You get to meet other engineers through lots of events. As an IPENS 
student member, you're very, very welcome to come along to lots and lots of branch events. You're very lucky at the University of Canterbury. There's lots of events that take place at the university. And it's a fantastic way of meeting other engineers uh, through presentations, meeting other engineers via going on site visits, uh, meeting other en engineers through social activities. Best of all, it's free. So why wouldn't you join? You also get access to the student area of the uh, IPENS website. Lots of great information on there. As a student member, you'll also receive an electronic newsletter from me every two months. And in that newsletter called Student Direct, you'll find out what other engineering students around the country are up to. And also what grads have been up to who are working in industry. And in your fourth year, you'll be able to apply for the Ray Meyer Medal for Excellence in Student Design. So I've just got a few quotes here from past members of, uh, that are past members of uh, IPENS as student members. One of them is Julian Stewart. He was actually the industry rep for INSOC last year. That's just what he's got to say. And another one we've got is from Brendan, who was studying at Victoria University. So very, very uh, quick process it is to become a student member of IPENS. Uh, most of you have probably picked up a little square brochure from me um, when you've come into the room or from outside on our table. Basically, you just jump onto a website, which is listed on there, www.ipens.org.nz, uh, fill in all the details, and you'll soon get a um, membership um, receipt of your membership, you'll get a login and you'll get a password. And you can basically remain a member of IPENS as a student member as long as you're studying engineering. So it's really good even when you become, um, when you start doing your postgrad work. And just to let you know, you won't get a certificate or get any post nominals to put after your name as a student member. Get lots of calls from students saying, where's my certificate? Sorry, we don't issue you one. I've remained, talked about that. And just the last thing, just like anything in life, to get, get the most out of it, you've got to put something in it. So if you become a student member, you'll get lots out of it. If you come to, come to the um, events, Join us, talk to people, but if you're waiting for things to happen, uh, you won't get much out of it. And that's me. So good luck with your engineering. We're outside if you have any questions. You're more than welcome to come and join IPENS now. We've got some computers set up. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you around campus. Thank you. All right, that ends the uh, presentation around um, forestry and engineering for the College of Engineering. Just as I said earlier, though, there is now going to be a presentation from Student Services, so I'd encourage you to remain uh, and engage with that to find out what's on offer across the rest of campus. And really, some final words from me is for both groups of students, the very best for your studies this year. Foresters, you won't be able to escape me. Um, engineers, you're not much better off either. Okay, So I look forward to engaging with you through the year. Good luck. <laughs>